Hello, welcome back to Normandy and chapter 8 of Rene and Me. Rene and Me by George East, read by Eugene Fraser. Our next guest at the digging party is Coco, returning from his weekly fungi raid on our woods. With its melange of mature beech and oak trees set in leaf mulch which reaches the kneecaps in autumn and has lain undisturbed for a few centuries, the copse at Lapouse is renowned for the quality and variety of mushrooms to be found there at all times of the year. This crop and the other natural harvests at Lapouse have long been regarded as fair game for anyone who will take the trouble to gather them. And we have long since given up trying to manage or deter the constant flow of locals arriving with stepladders, carrier bags, and even the occasional horse and cart. When we first arrived, we had unwisely put up a series of signs at the boundaries of the property, warning off all hunters and gatherers, assuming that as long as we marked the perimeters, they would be respected. On our next visit, the no-entry sign to the track down to the mill had vanished, and the chasse antedite placards were riddled with buckshot. We responded with bigger, more aggressive signs and rolls of barbed wire, but they too went missing in between visits. Finally, a truce and compromise was mediated by the mayor, who explained reassuringly that the vandalism was not aimed at us foreigners, but a manifestation of the locals' objection to our changing the rules of common usage which had existed at La Pousse for many years. Normally, trespassers venture on private land at their peril, and nobody would dream of setting foot on a proper farm. But La Pousse had been owned by a succession of Parisians and other foreigners who never appeared and obviously didn't give a hoot about who took advantage of the fruits of the land. From now on, John promised, the hunters would respect our peculiar wish to protect the wildlife on our terrain, while all Neu residents would continue to have access to the nuts, berries, wildflowers and herbs, which we didn't earmark for our own consumption. We would be welcome to shoot any trespassers from Saint-Jacques, naturally, and thought even more highly of if we managed to wing a couple. Not a keen nut or berry gatherer, our estate manager had made no objection to the deal as long as the apple harvest was left strictly alone, and we had struck a private treaty with Coco for exclusive foraging rights to the copse. Apart from being the owner of a leading bar and restaurant at saint Sauveur and a fervid Anglophile, Coco is quite deservedly acknowledged as the finest fungi expert in the region, if not all France, and a true eccentric, even by local standards. In everyday appearance, he resembles a Gothic engraving of an Old Testament prophet, and drives madly around the peninsula in a very battered Land Rover, with Mission Impossible crudely daubed on each side. Apart from allowing his wife to run the family business, he keeps busy with his constant quest for ever more exotic fungal growths, and staging musical extravaganzas in the church square next to the restaurant. Some malicious souls in the town allege that his wild eyes and erratic manner can be attributed to the regular consumption of a particular sort of mushroom. But I think it is merely his nature. Our arrangement, struck in his bar late one summer evening, was that he would have the full gathering rights to the cops, while in exchange we would be treated to an annual slap-up meal. Each course, of course, would contain suitable examples of a lapoose fungi. Last year, we arrived for our treat to find the town had apparently been invaded by the National Front. As the locals looked on with awe, huge youths with shaven heads, Union Jack T-shirts and lace-up boots gyrated happily in front of the church, while a band, advertised as the British Bulldogs, performed on a platform beside Coco's Bar. Nervously, we took our free lunch in the restaurant, and before leaving asked him if he was sure he had picked the right band for the sleepy town. He smiled dreamily and assured us that his customers were very fond of traditional English folk music. Surprisingly, the town remained unscathed, and all went so well that the band had booked for a return visit this summer. Coco also tells us that he's negotiating for an exchange visit of the saint Sauveur Abbey Choir to a forthcoming London folk concert featuring the Bulldogs and fellow artistes Die for England and We Hate F***ing Foreigners. This is the end of part two. The story continues on side three of the other cassette.
Rene and Me, Part 3. The adventure continues. By now, Coco has laid down his overflowing trug basket and is instructing us on the care and handling of any rare fungi species we may uncover. Marcel Bernard, Mr. Bellamy, Rinaldo and I are competing for spade room in the hole, and it is inevitable that René should appear like a pantomime demon king from behind the bike shed. Surveying the scene for a moment, he pronounces that Donella has gone too far this time. The pond we are digging will be well over water level, and will kill his beloved apple tree stone dead. I have rarely seen him so angry. I make a weak excuse about testing his theory about there being no room for the cherry tree, and we sheepishly fill the hole in under his watchful eye. As usual, he makes withering comments about the small size of my Spear and Jackson edging spade, and a debate begins on the proper way to move earth. Marcel, who at well over sixty-five still works at a prodigious rate with his long-handled gravedigger's shovel, while René prefers a huge bladed spade with a short handle made from an elm branch. Mr. Bellamy is loud in his defence of his US government issue entrenching tool. In time, and as the debate heats up, the hole disappears, and I give up my plans for finding the miller's gold. I invite the digging party indoors for drinks, and I think I hear the fox making an aside about fool's gold as we enter the farmhouse. <laughs> A long and diverting evening is over. Rinaldo and Janet have retired to the guest room, while our other friends have moved on to René's caravan for a nightcap to fortify themselves against the snow they all agree will soon be with us, despite the time of year and official forecasts of rain as usual until mid-July. Our impromptu soiree passed pleasantly, with a tasting of the selection of Italian wines Rinaldo brought with him and a contribution of his finest farmhouse cider from Marcel. I weighed in with a pack of Somerset cider cans, and Marcel, René, and Mr. Bellamy were mildly shocked to learn that it can be produced in Britain and even more surprised that it is drinkable, even good. They also expressed surprise that drinkable wine is made in Italy, and Rinaldo risked a row by pointing out that more bottles of allegedly French wine are produced each year than the amounts of grapes grown in France could possibly provide. It's a well-known secret in the industry, he claims, that many tons of lesser-grade Italian grapes are bought in each year to enable the communes to overproduce their so-called Appellation Contrôlée wines. Donella avoided potential unpleasantness by suggesting a game of Ludo, which René, as usual, won. My wife says that he cheats, but this is hard to prove, as he insists on playing by what he claims are the local rules, though we'd thought the game exclusive to Britain. His version entails throwing the dice under one hand, then telling us what the number is. Once Donella tried to get the better of him by suggesting a game of Scrabble, but that too was a mistake. He won with a huge number score by claiming that all the nonsense words he laid were ancien patois, which must be admissible as we were playing on his terrain. Neither could my wife possibly claim them to be false, as it was quite common in Norman French, which after all had its roots in Old Norse, for continents to require no vowels between them. Now we are alone, and walk out to stand on the balcony overlooking our land, and say good night to Le Pousse. It is an unseasonally bitter and breathlessly silent night, and yet again I am bewitched by the clarity and number of stars in the big Cotentin sky. In the distant water meadow, the placid surface of the big pond looks no more than a mirror-glass lake on a child's toy farm. An owl hoots on Hunter's Walk and is answered by a tetchy whinny from a horse in a neighbouring field. Beyond the mill, the stream continues its endless cascade into the magical grotto, and the unseen creatures of the dark are surely going contentedly about their business on such a perfect night. In this region, they call mills Listen when it rains, but for once there is not a cloud in the sky. Well, I hope you enjoyed that chapter of Rani and Me, and that you join us again for the next one. See you soon.
Rene and Me. Written by George East and read by Eugene Fraser.